Hey guys, it's October 1st, 2017, and this is your episode 114 of App Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and right here is Laurel Black. Hi. And Megan Arns is here. Hello. Ben Charles, how's it going, buddy? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you, Casey? Just fine. Thanks very much. So you guys, our guests today have just released their first CD. It's titled Trios for Two and is out on Innova Records. of a twist, hence the title, Trios for Two. Molly plays viola while Danny does this joint piano percussion thing, and he puts the, the, the percussion and piano next to each other to make these custom combinations and configurations that kind of allows him to treat everything as one instrument. So he'll tell us a lot more about that, I'm sure. So welcome to the show, Molly Gebrian and Danny Holt. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good to be with you. I can't believe it's October already. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Flying by. Ben, I think you had a, a question for them. Yeah, well, specifically for Molly, it's the it's still kind of the beginning of the school year here, and I I think that probably my colleagues would agree, especially with younger students, we're, we're struggling to remember how to teach our students how to practice. <laughs> it is always an uphill battle and never easy and some students have good practice habits some students have bad practice habits and some students have no habits at all and molly <laughs> it, it looks like you've been you this is an area of research for you and you have a, a list called the amazing list of practice techniques which i think is amazing and uh many of them are sort of viola specific but i think there could be adaptations to percussion for sure and i think that actually at some point this week i might sit down and, and write the percussion version of it but could you tell us about that list and how it came about and uh just i don't know anything about that list yeah sure so um i actually have a background also in neuroscience and um i've been giving a presentation for like 10 years now on what musicians can learn about practicing from brain research because like you said, a lot of students really don't practice well and they end up wasting their time. And um, my own personal students were always, you know, talking in their lessons about like good practice techniques and good ways to practice. And I kind of got sick of just like repeating the same thing over and over to all students. So a couple summers ago, I just sat down and I wrote out that list. Um, it's like four pages long. It's not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, but it's sort of the things that I use most often in my practicing that I find um, really effective that to me feel like the basic toolkit for practicing. Um, so yeah, I just sort of threw that together so I could put it up on my website and also give it to my students um, and you know, be able to say in lessons like, you know, on page three, there's all these ways to work on playing something faster and getting it you know, up to tempo. Do those things, they'll work, rather than taking you know, the whole lesson time to kind of explain through all those things. So, but yeah, you're right. There, a lot of them are very string specific, but most of them can be applied to any instrument. And then, just as sort of a follow up question to that, I I actually should have printed this out to show you guys. I have this little sheet I made, and it says the amazing new timekeeping device makes you play better. Use a metronome. And if I hear a student practicing without a metronome, I slip one underneath the door. <laughs> <laughs> and. A lot of the time when I when I catch students practicing without a met metronome and not very methodically at all, they say, oh, well, I'm just learning the notes. I'm just starting. So do you have any suggestions for how to kind of dive into a piece without uh, that, I don't know how to describe, that super exploratory phase where you're just kind of plunking out a bunch of wrong notes and it's we're sort of getting through it but not really getting anywhere? <laughs> Right. I mean, I, my first step always when I'm learning a new piece is to, I do like a, a, I go through and I figure out my fingerings and my bowings because as a string player, if you don't have those things, like you can't actually start because you don't know what you're doing, but then you have to get right down to work after that. There should be no sort of exploratory play a bunch of wrong notes phase. You're just wasting your time. Um, if, if you're doing that, the always practicing. So I spend the majority of my time practicing with metronome, but um, I would say percussionists practice with metronomes far more than string players. So, um, like, I do not use a metronome from the beginning at all. 
Um, and I think that's a much more percussion specific thing. Um, because when you're, for instance, working on intonation, which is what string players spend the majority of their lives working on, you don't want a metronome on, um, because it has nothing to do with tempo or rhythm at all. You're trying to play in tune. Um, so I think that is one place where it, it, there are like instrument specific differences because you guys don't have to really worry about intonation unless you're talking about like timpani, for instance. I make it a point to avoid intonation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My favorite response from students is always like, no, I didn't use a metronome because it messes me up. Right. I, always, I have this moment of like where my brain kind of like... <laughs> know what to do with the information I, yeah. I've, I've always found in a way actually that because we don't have to worry about intonation that can make people play kind of unmusically because we can just sort of hit the notes without any worry for the tone or anything like the sound of the phrase um, right but then one my, i think one of my favorite things you you talk about on there and this is something that drives me crazy in rehearsals actually is don't do run-throughs of your piece. A run-through is generally a waste of time, and it, it drives me crazy when band conductors or orchestra conductors do two run-throughs of a piece in one rehearsal. It's like, well, if we can get through the piece and we're good, we don't need to rehearse it. Or if there's something we need to work on, we should be working on it, not running it. So, Yeah. Good stuff. I... Well, Molly, I don't know if you remember, but our, our conductor at Rice, Molly and I met at Rice, y'all. Oh, okay. That's the connection. Cool. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, he would just, first day of rehearsal, make us run through the whole piece. And I thought it was incredibly useful because it terrified us to death. And you, you got to see how much work you had to do. And if you didn't come in ready... It really exposed you. Yeah. You know, you felt really, really exposed. See, so yeah, yeah, no, that's a great, good idea. Very was amazing. I mean, yeah, that first rehearsal we do a run through at tempo. It wasn't like we were under tempo. I mean, I remember. Yeah. Um, also sprach, and the first rehearsal we read that thing through at tempo. That piece is so hard. <laughs> The yeah. whole orchestra got lost, and Larry just like kept going, like he was conducting a concert. You know. Yeah. And he, but, and he'd just he'd just glare at you when when something wasn't right. He'd just keep going and glare at you like, right. really? You you can't do that yet? Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> so, is yeah. day one? At yeah. at UNT they did the same thing, but the other catch at UNT was you never played it through ever again until the actual concert. Yeah, Larry was an amazing rehearser. He yeah, mm -hmm. we did not do run throughs until like the week of the concert. He rehearsed exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. mm. I have a question for Danny, since we haven't heard from you yet. I'm in a long distance duo. You guys are in a long distance duo. So two questions. How did you meet? And then how do you manage having to do so much preparation apart? Well, we met when we were teenagers at a summer music program in West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, so we go way back. Wow. 20 years. More than 20 years. More than 20 years, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. 1996. Yeah. yeah. So we've been really good friends for years, but we had never actually been in the same place. We went off in different directions, different parts of the country, different parts of the world for school, grad school, all that stuff. And um, so finally we started talking about, you know, we should like make some music together at some point, right? Let's do this. And so that's when Molly was at Rice and was... Uh, looking to take on some kind of, you know, big project, something more than just your average recital. And at that point, I'd been doing the piano percussion thing for a few years, and I'd been toying around with the idea of throwing another musician into the mix and just kind of upping the, uh, the antics and the absurdity of it all. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so anyway, so we do have a long history, but had never actually played together before. But because we're such good friends, the musical chemistry um, has always been really easy and, um, Molly is always meticulously prepared. Um, I mean, I think we both do our best to practice on our own because of the nature of the piano percussion thing. And the fact that each piece kind of forces me to reinvent my technique. Um, I'm always <laughs> kind of the crazed, overwhelmed lunatic part of our duo <laughs> and Molly is the one who thank goodness is just um, meticulously prepared and can put up with all of my antics 
<laughs> I thought about giving Molly a hi hat on her part. <laughs> we yeah, got, yeah, we feet aren't doing it. anything. It's fine. Molly, some percussion. That might yeah. be the next step. She's, mm -hmm. some, she's a little resistant to the idea. <laughs> I mean, you, you have training as a percussionist, and I have zero. But I mean, I would be happy to play percussion that doesn't really take much skill. Um, yeah, that's all of it, actually. <laughs> right, I was gonna say, yeah, you just you just hit it. Let's be honest. <laughs> Danny, can you explain your piano percussion project for listeners who haven't come across it yet? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I have always been a, a pianist, and. Percussion was kind of my second instrument, and you know, at, at a certain point in your in your life, in your music education, you have to make choices, and you know, you can't do everything. So uh, at a certain point, I had decided to give percussion a backseat and really focus on developing as a pianist. Um, to make a long story short, I I always missed playing percussion. I always felt a more intuitive, instinctual connection to percussion. I've actually never really felt like a pianist, even though it's always been my primary instrument. I've always felt like a musician who happens to play the piano. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was kind of looking for ways to start playing percussion again. Um, and I ended up at the Bang on a Can Summer Music Institute for the first two summers that they did that, which was an absolute blast. And I was there as a pianist, but they knew that I played percussion, so there were a couple times where they uh, asked me to play some percussion. And David Cosson, the percussionist for the All-Stars, he made an arrangement of a Michael Gordon piece and had me playing keyboard and kick drum. And I tell this story all the time, and it's it really was like one of those light bulb above the head moments. I was I was playing keyboard and kick drum and just like really getting into it. And I was just like, this is really fun. <laughs> I need to do more of this. And I just <laughs> I kind of had this vision. It kind of came to me in a vision, which sounds absurd, but it is true, um, of me sitting at the piano and just being surrounded by percussion instruments. So over the next few months and years, I, um, I just started brainstorming about what would actually be possible and what would be musically interesting. And then eventually started acquiring instruments and, and importantly, talking to some composer friends of mine and saying, hey, I've got this crazy idea, sitting at the piano, surrounding myself with percussion instruments. Um, what do you think about that? Would you think about writing a piece? And uh, Thankfully, a lot of composers have been intrigued enough by that idea that I've been kind of slowly building a, a repertoire of solo piano percussion music. Way cool. Yeah, super way cool. Especially the Blue Man Group thing. <laughs> What's the Blue Man uh, Group thing? I, I, I had a, a brief appearance with Blue Man Group at the Bowl a few years ago. It was definitely one of the most fun things I've ever done. Um, and actually, speaking of piano percussion, I, that... I was I was brought in as a pianist, so it was like me front and center with the piano, and then the Blue Man Group behind me, and then the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra behind them. It was such a blast, and it was just this one tune on a whole program where they were bringing in lots of guest artists. And as part of the shtick, they um, they wanted me to play um, crash cymbals, uh, a couple crash cymbal hits, and I don't even think they knew that I was a percussionist. They just got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyone can do that. <laughs> yeah, that was that was fun. Yeah. So the, your crashes sounded way better than they thought they would, probably. <laughs> yeah. It was supposed to be funny, but it turned out good. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was really good. I was there for that concert. Oh, I, really? I, yeah, that was cool. when I was living in LA. Yeah, that was really amazing. There, there's a video of it. There there's some rough video uh, from someone in the audience. Yeah, yeah that's cool. what I saw on your website, and I was like, oh, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> he gets up and, like, yep. crashes, and then goes back to the piano. <laughs> Blue, Man Group is, Blue Man Group is playing at PASIC this year. I'm excited about I that. I noticed that, yeah. yeah. But I we'll, wonder which troupe it is. Which, that's, uh, which... that's the thing. Yeah, they have several different groups. Right. Some people right, yeah. are very confused when they find out that it's not just the Blue Man Group. It's like, you know, there are several different incarnations of the Blue Man Group. Yeah, totally professional uh, operation and just, just an, an absolute pleasure to work with them. Well, Danny, I had sort of a follow-up question based on when I was looking at your website. We've talked about before on here about like one-off performances and doing really unique things. And it's not the most <clears throat> practical thing to do always because you would think as as professional musicians we like to do 
a certain amount of preparation then get multiple performances out of it and i know on your piano duo video you talked about you found this 12 foot grand piano and you wanted to play rite of spring as a duo on it and it's probably fairly rare that you come across another 12 foot piano and that you have the opportunity to perform rite of spring as a piano duo so how do you balance out the sort of uniqueness of your projects with the practicality of needing to do things more than once yeah that's a great question and actually in my uh, kind of postgraduate school, you know, figuring out how to make a, a life in music uh, period, it's becoming increasingly important to think strategically about that because, you know, when you're in school, it's such a luxury. You know, you may spend an entire academic year preparing a program and then you play it once. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've become increasingly sensitive. I, I feel like it's difficult to justify putting in an incredible amount of work um, if there's a limited performance opportunity. I guess I've been pretty lucky in that even though a lot of the things that I do are pretty unusual, I've found ways to, to do them a lot. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, with the piano percussion thing, for me, the, the thing that, that uh, slows me down and stresses me out the most is just dealing with all the gear. You know, and mostly that's because I'm primarily a pianist and I'm not, you know, dealing with gear is not something that I do every day. You know, he's gone it's, soft, Danny. <laughs> he's gone. He's gone soft. He's lost his way. We yeah. love that portion of it. I, I, I go through, I go through, uh, you know, I'll typically have like three to four months out of the year where I've got all my percussion gear set up and I'm in full on piano percussion mode. And there are, there are, there may be times where, you know, several times within, oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking about like Molly, the concerts we were doing um, last fall, we did like five concerts in seven days or something like that. Although in those places we were using a lot of gear that the venues were providing, but oftentimes I'm just packing everything up, putting everything into my little car and then going somewhere and unloading it and setting it all up. Um, and sorry, this is a very long, boring, rambling answer to your question, but um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I think about the logistics almost as much as I end up thinking about the artistic part of things. So like even just earlier today, Molly and I were talking about we're, we have a performance in Michigan in, a, in about a month, and I was trying to think, like, all right, is there any other performance we could do then when I've already got all my stuff in the suitcases? Because <laughs> I'm just looking for, like, one more opportunity to avoid having to about, take down all my stuff and figure out how to get it in the suitcases. Do you make Molly help you? Yes, um, I have <laughs> I have assigned jobs. I can't do much, but I have assigned jobs that I that I am trusted to handle. You sound pretty happy about it, so I don't think he's making or do anything. No, I, I'm happy to help. I just don't want to like screw up any gear, right? So I get simple things that I can do without like breaking something. Well, especially when we're, when we're in a groove, when we're when we're actually doing like a sequence of, of performances in a short period of time, we do get into a, a nice groove of the you know both the loading in and setting up and the post concert tear down. We've had all sorts of interesting experiences too, because I mean, with a project like this, um, the ideal situation is to have the hall all day and to be able to load in, take my time setting up and, uh, you know, just really fine tune <clears throat> all the hardware and get everything exactly where I want it. Because I find I get so accustomed to the exact placement of, you know, a certain drum in relation to where I sit at the piano that especially if I'm using someone else's hardware, like if I'm on tour somewhere, where I have to fly and I can't bring all my own stuff. Um, <clears throat> it takes a lot of time to adjust and get all that stuff right. So ideally, we have a huge chunk of time where we can just focus on getting all that stuff ready and then like take a break, take some deep breaths, eat some food, and then come back and like actually be a musician <laughs> and not just be dealing with all the gear. Um, but it's not often the case that we have that kind of a luxurious schedule. <laughs> In fact, especially when we're performing at colleges and universities, oftentimes, the venues are scheduled so tight that we are, you know, lucky to get in there an hour, an hour and a half before the downbeat. And oh, yeah. so it's been um, exhilarating and kind of ridiculous how quickly we've had to uh, get the piano percussion set up. And I've just had to learn to kind of prioritize. And if we only have a certain amount of time, I just know there are certain things that we're just not, we're not going to be able to get it or I'm not going to be able to get it exactly the way I want it. Um, and I've kind of made peace with that. Right, and we're both at the point now that 
we like that one concert in Madison, we were setting up until five minutes before the concert was supposed to start. So we didn't get any personal warm up time. We didn't get any duo warm up time. We just had to like put everything together and like walk on stage and play. And that was really stressful. Um, but we can do that if we have to. Yes. Yeah. Thankfully, we know we know the repertoire well enough because we've got kind of a core repertoire that we've been playing. That's mostly the repertoire that's on the CD. And yeah, we we've rehearsed it thoroughly enough that uh, I mean, the other thing that's great is, you know, we were talking earlier about the long distance collaboration. The other thing is, since we've been working together and on this repertoire for six years now, something like that, right? Um, you know, on and off and new pieces have come into the repertoire and other pieces have gone out. But um, we're at the point now where we can get back together after having not rehearsed in months or even like a year and things come back together pretty quickly. So that's nice. But yeah, one of the things about the piano percussion thing that's been challenging for me definitely is just dealing with the gear and not feeling so oppressed by that. <laughs> it, um, it, it reminds me of a teacher of Laurel and I's who actually, coincidentally, Danny, you have a striking resemblance to. Yeah. But, <laughs> but Sam Solomon had oh, this. Yeah. Has yeah. The, right? <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, actually, totally. that's the guy Danny from Tanglewood when we were in high school and you went up to him and you're like, you look like me. That's oh, my no. gosh. For real? Yeah, yeah for yeah. real. People used, to, people used to come up to me and like start talking to me at Tanglewood and other places because I think he was, he, he was from Boston. Yeah, well, he, he's still yeah. there. Yeah. 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 yeah, and he was at TMC or something the year we were at like BUTI, like high school Tanglewood. Yeah, people would mistake the two of us. I don't know if it ever happened that's to him, hilarious. but definitely walked up to me and started having conversations with me and I'd be like, sorry, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> rad. Wow. Figured it yeah, out. That's, that's wonderful. But, but while, while I was at Boston Conservatory, he had a, a commissioning project for multi-percussion, but he said, my, my instrument is the following. And he had a specific setup diagram, specific instruments. You can write for all of these in this configuration or some of these in this configuration. And that was it. And it was very generous. There was a lot of stuff. But yeah, the logistical thing is such a problem. And I know mm -hmm. I've complained about it on this show before when it, it becomes more about that than the music. And yeah. yeah, it just gets frustrating when composers just seem to need to pile on more things to make music. And it's like, man, you got to, yeah. I don't know. I feel like we, at some point, we need to be allowed to say like, no, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you eight concert bass drums. <laughs> So that, you, so that you can hear one loud bang at the end. I, I just, that's not your achievement. It's the per people who hauled it. <laughs> it's like, that's who that achievement belongs to, you know? So it's just, yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah. and one of the nice things about working with living composers, though, is that, you know, you can have conversations about this. And I yeah. know, like, a lot of the new commissions that I've done, it's been like, I want to be able to put this into my RAV4. <laughs> Mm -hmm. think about what instruments fit into this size space, you know? Yeah. And so, well, I mean, the yeah. Way I have it is for, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Casey. Oh, I, I guess I, I would say a lot of composers, I think they get a sense of relief when you put those restrictions on. Because mm. if you just say, give me something for percussion, it's just this ocean of possibilities. And that's really hard to write for. But if you say, no, I want this and this and that, 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 and here the setup is already there, a lot of the creative work is done already you know so i yeah i think they end up appreciating it well when i started developing the piano percussion setup um i started you know playing around with ideas picking the brains of my percussionist and composer friends and colleagues and finally came up with a basic setup which is it's more or less a five-piece drum kit plus bongos glockenspiel tam tam that's 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 basically the, the the core of the setup, and um, so I acquired those instruments and started playing around with things, and then I made a basic diagram that I could share with composers. Um, but I didn't want I didn't want to limit it only to those instruments. I wanted to think of that as a starting point. But I asked composers to keep me involved in the creative process, even in the early brainstorming stages, so that we can avoid um, things that aren't. That, are, that either aren't logistically feasible or are truly impossible uh, in terms of the gear. I mean, one of the limitations is what can I fit in my little hatchback car? <laughs> yeah. uh, or, yeah. or what can I reasonably expect most venues would be able to provide me with? Um, mm -hmm. And what's happened over the years, over the almost decade that I've been doing this, um, 
composers have come up with really fun, interesting ideas that I haven't thought of. Um, and it's great. But what happens is, like, I'm practicing one piece at home where, you know, uh, I'm playing a melodica that's controlled with a foot pump. And then another composer comes over and sees that. And they're like, oh, my God, that's so cool. I'm going to put that in my piece, too. Right. Now, everywhere I go, I'm carrying a melodica and this big foot pump to control the melodica. <laughs> and, um, you know, and some of the most inventive and successful, musically successful piano percussion pieces are the ones where the composers do get some really interesting ideas about some small things they can add to the piano percussion setup. And that's all great, but the problem is that when each composer starts adding like one or two little things, all of a sudden, right. you know, like there's a fantastic solo piano percussion piece by Oscar Bettison. But um, anytime I'm playing that piece, if I'm on the road, like aside from my normal two big suitcases of my own specialty gear, I have to have a separate suitcase just for Oscar's piece of these like three old school metronomes and he's the, the melodica, the melodica foot pump and uh, some specialty bells, you know, all this other stuff. So yeah, the logistics are always a consideration. And sometimes it just comes down to, you know, there are certain things that I can do when I'm performing somewhere within driving distance where I know that there are things that I've got that I can bring with me. And then there are certain things where if I'm limited to what I can fit in two suitcases and what a university, you know, percussion department can provide, I may have to avoid certain pieces or make some compromise, some musical mm -hmm. compromise. Ben, what do you got? We're talking about this collaboration between composers and performers, and it reminds me of, I think I've told part of the story on the podcast before about some of the early marimba repertoire. For example, I think it's Kevin Putz's Canyon for solo marimba. One of the movements, uh, I love that piece. It's, one of the movements is a very clear ripoff of the Bach prelude in B-flat number 21 that Lee Stevens played. And if you look at the music notation on the Kevin Putz piece and the Bach piece, it's like exact, it's like he, he wrote it the same way. <laughs> Um, uh -huh. And I could, ha I could, it might not be Canyon. I can't remember. I'm trying to remember Mersh's percussion literature class, but one of the early marimba pieces. But then my my favorite story of this nature is that when Druckmann was writing his reflections on the nature of water, he came over to Bill Mersh's Manhattan loft apartment, and Mersh played some marimba repertoire from for him. And one of the things he played was the two Mexican dances. The first one, where there's this left hand ostinato and the right hand fills in the gaps with the melody. And Druckmann liked that, so he ripped it off, and he put that in the fourth movement of Reflections on the Nature of Water. Say on the, the subject of, like, when you're commissioning a piece, because my duo partner and I will perform at universities, but it's really half and half there, and then completely different venues. And so we're already moving a five-octave marimba. So the thought of, like, adding other gear, I always tell them it has to fit in a backpack. If it doesn't fit in a backpack, nice. it's a no-go because we're already moving a huge instrument. And it never fails. Like, our most recent uh, commission, the guy goes, could we add vibraphone? And I said, unless it's tiny and fits in a backpack, no. <laughs> no yeah. one those, those backpack model vibraphones. You got one of those vibraphones you add hot water to and it, like, <laughs> just, like, <laughs> folds out. Yeah. 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 It's real. <laughs> So I was going to do a little move from uh, from this, do my little what's the sound segment. So I have a hint for you guys this week and get my get my gear going here. So the hint is this has to do with current viola news. <laughs> easy one but i bet somebody knows the current viola news well the cu most current viola news is they just discovered a new piece by shostakovich for viola and piano correct oh yeah so that is, that is right so the moscow archive just a few days ago september 25th was dmitry shostakovich's birthday and he of course has 
very famous viola sonata, sonata, so viola and piano, and then that piece gets played a whole lot. I bet you've played that piece probably, Molly? Yep, yeah, that's super standard for us. It's the last thing he wrote, and then he died, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of the the one stock. It's like all you really have, that solo, right? From Shostakovich? Yeah, yeah, right, from Shostakovich. Yeah, there is an arrangement of four pieces from one of his operas that someone did for viola and piano that's, that's nice, but the only thing that's written for us is that solo piece is the sonata. Gotcha, cool, cool. So, right, so on his birthday, just a few days ago, September 25th, the Moscow Archive revealed a newly discovered Shostakovich work for viola and piano. This was originally given the opus title number 33, but that was later recycled to be used on what I just played for you. So what I just played for you is opus 33 called Song of the Counterplan from the 1932 movie called Counterplan. So this film is generally considered one of many Stalin propaganda films and one of the earliest Shostakovich of nearly 50 film scores. The movie is about catching a group of what are called wreckers in a Soviet factory. Wreckers were, I guess, what they the word they use for saboteurs or underminers of Stalin's agenda. So Opus 33 was originally on this viola work. And of course, I would love to have played the actual viola work for you, but I can't even lay eyes on it. There's very little about it. And I was really excited to find it and like enter it into finale or something. But of course, it's not that easy to see. So this is the best I could do. That was exciting. Much better than last time. Sorry, Danny? We gotta find that piece and then add some percussion to it. Ha! I know, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so, already public domain, right? I mean, I would think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I would think so. So, you guys, I have the CD right here. This is great. We got a lot of good conversation Yay! out of this. And the CD is out, and part of this episode is to celebrate the CD's release. And I guess I was gonna ask, you know, how did you pick? And of course, I'm very happy to be one of the composers on this CD. That's really, really cool. And it sounds so good. It came out so wonderful. And it's really cool to have the first track on the CD. I was just going to ask, how did you guys, how did you go about selecting which composers you would ask and who you would use? And um, Well, originally when this project started at Rice, I was obviously living in Houston. Danny was living in L.A. And we originally started... Um, by I came up with some composers, like Houston-based composers that I whose music I really liked, and I sent their names or websites or whatever to Danny, and then he did the same for some LA-based composers. Um, so he is Danny essentially ch- chose the Houston composers. I essentially chose the LA composers, um, and so that's how the project started in terms of rep. But then, um, in terms of selecting music for the CD. Um, we knew that we wanted to include at least one brand new piece. So that's Chayu's piece, um, which I think that's the last thing on the CD. I don't even remember the order of the CD anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Chayu's Chayu, piece yeah. is last. Yeah, so that's the, the brand new piece that was essentially commissioned for the CD. Um, and we actually recorded it before we ever performed it, which was a really kind of odd experience. But then the other pieces, you know, it was just like, which pieces, when we started this project, which pieces did we really like performing? Which pieces were really successful with audiences? So we just, yeah, kind of went from there. And, you know, we're always looking for composers who, based on their works that we have a chance to see or hear, composers who, first of all, we're confident that they can write for both viola and piano and percussion. Um, but also that we have some good feeling that they're going to have a, some, that we have a feeling that they're going to be able to handle the unique logistical challenges of writing for solo piano percussion, but also more importantly, that they're going to approach it with a sense of you know imagination and adventure and that they're going to come up with something, hopefully that we, that we haven't even imagined. Hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Is there a, is there a project for CD2 in the I'm sure not where immediate plans, but is that our gears working for that? I'm always developing my own solo piano percussion repertoire. And um, so that's an ongoing project. And Trios for Two, we're still out there playing concerts of this repertoire. And actually, we were just talking earlier today about how it's kind of it's about time um, for us to start 
thinking about some new repertoire. So actually, one of the reasons why it's great to have this CD out there is hopefully it will inspire some people to want to explore this weird instrumentation with us. I also like the idea of doing uh, of, 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 of pursuing some other uh, collaborations, you know, piano percussion and other instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, after doing the solo piano percussion thing for a while, I found it really liberating to get someone else involved, to get another, not only another person, so I'm just not by myself all the time, <laughs> but, but, uh, but another instrument. And we found the composers, uh, it was just interesting to see how the composers responded to the challenge of writing for this instrumentation. And um, something that happens a lot is that they end up finding ways to treat the viola like a percussion instrument. Hmm. So, which is also something that happens a lot with the piano percussion writing. It, people uh, will find interesting ways to kind of fuse the, the piano and percussion into kind of one instrument. And so with trios for two, the viola is, um, you know, sometimes like uh, it's a separate voice and sometimes an antagonistic voice. And sometimes it's more integrated into the piano percussion so that there are some moments where all three instruments are almost one instrument. Those mm -hmm. are my favorite moments. Yeah, no, I was, it was, I mean, Danny and I, we've talked about this before a lot, that it was really interesting to us to see how many of the composers asked me to use very, like, noisy extended techniques, right? There's lots of different extended techniques you can do on the viola, and some of them are more, like, noisy and or percussive than others. And in general, not all of them, like, Casey, your, your piece, I just, like, play, you know, like, normal the whole time and count like a maniac. Um, and, um, you know, Chris Goddard's piece, um, is pretty like standard in terms of the sound world I'm asked to use, but a lot of the pieces use a lot of really unusual extended techniques that are more noisy and percussive than like you would generally find for, you know, standard viola writing, I would say. Um, so that was just, you know, interesting to have me be treated as a percussion instrument too. Mm -hmm piece is the best example of that I think and a lot of her music is uh, is interested in exploring the kind of intersection between acoustic and electronic music so it's it's all acoustic sounds but they sometimes almost really sound more electronic than acoustic yeah no I spend more of Ingrid's piece playing behind the bridge and making really like gross sounds which is like the most fun thing ever than I do playing normally sure Sure. I wonder, did, did any of the composers have a hesitation to do piano percussion? Maybe they wanted to just do one because they are thinking of the longevity of the piece and getting other people to play it. Like maybe they said, can it just be viola piano or can it just be percussion viola? You know, that's an interesting question. Oh, sorry, Danny. Um, Dr. Lavenda, who I'm sure you remember, Casey. Um, oh, yeah who was my advisor at Rice, that was exactly what he brought up the first time I sort of pitched this project to him. Like, why would composers want to write for this? Nobody else can play it, uh -huh. right? So like with the longevity of the piece. And that's definitely a concern. It's been funny. I have played this piano percussion repertoire more than any other piece I've ever played. Cool. Um, we've just performed it so much. And actually Carl's piece, I performed at Rice as an actual trio mm -hmm. on... on Carl's composition recital, I think, with Robbie. Um, and then Robbie ended up learning the piano percussion part to play it. Oh, and cool. Carl made a concerto version for Robbie that Robbie, Robbie a concerto competition with. So, you know, you'd think that this repertoire would not lend itself to repeat performances and longevity, but our experience has been weirdly the exact opposite. Um, and I noticed like, Dr. Lavenda didn't make the CD. He didn't write <laughs> So, it's not all about you, so, man, you know? So, Casey, to, to, to answer your question, I mean, if, if I don't honestly remember if that ever happened, but if someone did say, oh, well, can I write a piece just for viola and percussion, we would say, well, no, I mean, that's not what Trios for Two is. I mean, Trios right. for Two is a, an, ex, an exploration of this unique instrumentation. Um, right. But also, like, like Molly said, I mean, we're, we're very committed when, um, when someone writes us a piece and it's a successful piece, we're very committed to performing it a lot you know we we want to really want to get the music out there so so one answer to that question is well um it may not be you may you may not have dozens or hundreds of people around the world playing the piece but the piece is going to get played quite a bit but also my my feeling more 
just kind of thinking more broadly about the whole nature of this solo piano percussion thing that I've been doing, my feeling is it's an experiment for me and for the composers. And a part of, I've actually had to do some serious thinking these last couple of years about like, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> because it's, it, it's really cool. It's really fascinating. It's really fun, but it's also the, the most challenging and insane thing I've ever attempted to do. And there are always times where in the middle of my practice session, I just, I just put the mallets down and I just go, what have I done? What have I gotten myself into? Um, I always rally. Uh, but <laughs> um, I think what has driven me to pursue this project has been a desire to constantly push myself to, to go past what I know I'm, what I already know I'm capable of. So I have a sense of what I know I'm capable of, and I'm just always looking to, to push that further. Mm -hmm. And so it's an experiment for me in that way. And it's, a, it's an experiment for the composers and the composers end up coming up with all this stuff that, um, that I wouldn't have thought of on my own. And that's challenged me to completely reinvent how I approach, you know, the instrument. Um, so I would like to think that, well, actually I know for a fact that, um, aside from the example that Molly mentioned, uh, of a percussionist who actually, um, decided to tackle, uh, one of these, solo piano percussion pieces. I know that a couple other people have played them and there's, there's no reason why other people can't play a lot of these pieces. Um, a lot of them are pieces that a percussionist who has good basic piano skills and is willing to put in the work could play or a pianist who's willing to learn some basic percussion could play. But then there are certain pieces that you really do need to be a trained pianist and percussionist and willing to put in <laughs> the crazy amount of work that's necessary. But um, I'm really happy, now, especially now that this CD is out there, I'm really happy that not only hopefully will composers hear this and think, oh, that's an interesting idea, but hopefully some performers will hear that and go, oh, gosh, I'd like to try that or try something like that. You know, I'm all about thinking outside the box and pushing yourself to do things that you don't think you're capable of doing. It's such a success, I think. I mean, the CD is just really good. That's all I, I don't know. That's all I can say. I mean, it's just turned out so well. And yeah, you guys just did a great job. Thank you. Well, by the time we recorded the music, we had performed it so much that we knew it really well, with the exception of Chayu's piece, which, as Molly mentioned, we, we had only learned shortly before we ended up recording it. So um, that was kind of an interesting experience. But you know, there are also certain things because of the unique challenges of the piano percussion and sometimes things like sight lines between the two of us, there are certain things in live performance that are almost impossible to do that are easier to do when you're in the recording studio. Uh, but there were some interesting challenges too, because we were recording for me as a pianist, one of the frustrating realities is, you know, it's hard to find a great place to record that has a really excellent piano. So I often end up recording in a room that's maybe not the most ideal room to record in, but it's got a great piano. So that we were recording in the Wild Beast at Cal Arts, north of LA. Oh, that yeah. venue is so cool! It's, it is really cool, but it's it's kind of a bathtub. Uh, oh, I've never heard it. I've just seen it. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's co concrete floors and like really high ceilings, lots of like um, you know metal beams and. Oh, that's not so cool. Um, it, I mean, it actually is a good, it's a good place for live acoustic uh, performance. Maybe not the best place to record. And then we had like, we had uh, one day where in January where it was raining. Of course, it like never rains in LA, right? And it rains and the Wild Beast has a tin roof. So we had to cancel recording that day. And then there was, I don't remember if this was when we were recording Chayu's piece or if it was another solo thing I was doing in there last year. But um, there were like birds, some really, really loud birds, like in the eaves, just outside. So, oh man. But what we figured out, we figured out that in that space anyways, that you could record viola and percussion, or you could record viola and piano, or you could record piano and percussion. Any of those combinations of two, you could make work really well. <laughs> the, the, the combination of those three was really, really challenging. Hmm. So, um, there were some compromises that had to be made. But it all came out. It came out okay. 
<laughs> recording the recording this stuff is is always interesting because I, in a way I feel like the piano percussion stuff and and even more so the trios for two stuff it, it it can be more successful when it's recorded because in live performance you know I'm sitting here at the piano and a lot of the instruments are over to my left or underneath the piano and so those things in a live concert where there's no amplification they sound really distant um, so. Uh, it, it was it was great to record this repertoire where we could um, create kind of an immersive experience. The way I like to think of it is like um, if you're listening to it on good speakers or on headphones, you should just feel like you're just immersed in the the sound world. And like I said, there are times where maybe you can't even tell like what's piano, what's percussion, and what's viola. Hey, well, Megan, what do you have for us today? Well, I'm breaking out of my usual current events segment thing and i'm kind of doing something related to my research today which is uh, my lecture recital that i gave to finish my degree in april of last year i kind of talked about that a little bit on the podcast but i've recently been doing a couple more performance of performances of it in other places and revising it a little bit and i found something new that i thought was really cool that i wanted to share with you guys today it's called sun and moon music has anyone heard of that before? Yeah, I hadn't either. And I cannot find much information about it online. Um, but I can tell you something that is actually not online anymore that I had printed before when I was doing my original research. And to back it up a little bit, the topic is about Per Norgard, who's a Danish composer. And I sent you guys an article uh, to kind of prep you for it a little bit, but for our listeners, I wanted to read just a little bit about the composer Per Norgard in case you have not heard of him before. He was born in Denmark in 1932, so he's pretty old now. He studied composition with von Homba at the Royal Danish Academy of Music in Copenhagen and Nadia Boulanger in Paris. He has composed works in like all of the major genres, such as operas, ballets, symphonies, pieces for orchestra, concertos, choral, vocal works, a lot of chamber works, including 10 string quartets, and also several solo instrumental works. I think what we know him the most for, probably as percussionist, is his solo work, I Ching, which is part of what my research is based on. But he also has written a lot of other solo percussion works as well. Um, his works are frequently performed in Europe and are slowly gaining attention in the United States. There was a three-day Norgard in New York festival two summers ago, June 2016. And he was born in 1932, so he's about 85 now, and he's still actively composing today. So his compositions are kind of fit into three different compositional periods. His first one is his Nordic style, where he was really composing in uh, the style of composers who had come before him. And his second is serial, his serialist period. And this is when he was experimenting with um, composing hierarchically and cyclically. And he invented something called the infinity series during this time. I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but <laughs> the whole presentation is like 50 minutes. So I'm trying to squeeze it into five. I would tell you more about the infinity series in that presentation. But the third uh, compositional period is the Wolfie phase, where he was influenced by Swiss artist Adolf Wolfie, who was a schizophrenic, bizarre, surrealist, explosively energetic uh, artist. And he went in this period from composing uh, like cyclically and hierarchically to composing bar to bar. And so this idea of sun and moon music fits into the second period because of the Infinity series. Have you guys heard of the Infinity series before? Only in in that verbiage, only in terms of pure Norgard, but I'm trying yeah. to figure out, and the thing I was going to ask you is, is this related to the branch of mathematics that deals with quantities of infinity? Yes, it is. Okay. Cool. It is I'm in familiar some way, with that a little bit. But. I cannot really speak to that intelligently, but what I can tell you that it is a mathematical sequence and it has fractal properties. And Norgard used this in his composition techniques from the 60s, about the 60s to the 80s. And this form that's found really a lot in I Ching is the simplest form. It's a rhythmic infinity series and it's just two notes. So basically what he's doing is he's giving you one note, 
and a second note, and then he's inverting it. That's all. And then when you do that, you know, you invert it. You got those two notes, you invert them, and then you invert that whole series. Then it gives you double the amount, double the amount, double the amount, et cetera, et cetera. So also kind of within this piece, he's using the infinity series and these two notes, but it's also representing the yin and yang because he's taking, if, if you're familiar with the solo work, it's in four movements and the movement titles are named after four different hexagrams found in the, the Chinese book of oracles, the I Ching. And so uh, these bright and dark sounds that are juxtaposed throughout the entire work are, are, are used constantly. So the Infinity series explains the way that these are ordered. And uh, that was kind of the basis. Finding all of these examples and finding Balinese influence is the basis for my research. But what I came across recently that, that, I, that I wanted to share today is sun and moon music, which is this exact same thing. However, sun and mu moon music is actually a genre that was popular in, this, in the 70s. And Ivan Hansen was one of the most prominent musicians and music teachers within this particular music genre. And he said this, quote, the so-called sun and moon music developed in the 70s in private musical circles at folk high schools and similar institutions or by ensembles at academies of music appears to have given rise to a kind of music within Norgard's music and a form that creates a link between a more spontaneous kind of music making and Norgard's complicated compositional techniques. End quote. So this reminds me of the cage percussion players, right? This kind of this this genre was used, like he said, at, at folk, you know, in folk music circles and in universities. And what it was is more than a compositional method, but kind of a technique that people would learn and then they would improvise together. So it only takes about 10 minutes he says, to learn how to manage the 64 note row of this rhythmic infinity series. But since we're all musicians here and a lot of us are percussionists, I could teach it to you in like one minute and a half. Here we wow. go. So here it is. The extrapolation of the opposition between bright and dark. First, play one bright note and it's opposite, a dark note. So I'm just going to say like, so this would be a disaster to try to do this on the podcast, right? If we're all trying to do this in sync. So I'm just going to say it, but this, let's say low, high or bright, dark. And then you play step two, play a bright two note group, high, low, and it's opposite low, high, high, low, low, high. Got it. Then step three, play a bright four note group, low, high, high, or um, high, low, low, high. And it's opposite low, high, high, low. Makes sense? So it's just mm -hmm. like doubling, basically. Step four, play a bright eight note group. High, low, low, high, low, high, high, low, and it's opposite, et cetera, et cetera, right? Next, play a bright 16 note group while remi remembering it as A, a bright four note group, B, a dark four note group, C, a, four, a dark four note group, D, a bright four note group. So, you know, this gets confusing when we're using words, but if we were to see this visually, it's quite simple, right? So people would memorize this and then improvise within it, within that sequence by removing notes. Uh, and I still think it sounds kind of hard <laughs> to do that. Sound, yeah, it doesn't sound easy. Yeah, especially if it was done orally, which I don't know. It sounds like it was done orally, but... Um, I'm not sure, but apparently this was done in musical, in, in circles. And uh, like I said, it reminds me of the cage percussion players a little bit or, you know, different circles where people would get together and play different types of music or, or improvise. And this was happening in the 70s. So maybe it makes sense um, that, this, that this, this type of thing would be popular. So um, – that's really all I've got. I mean, I could keep going about the Infinity series and how it's present in the I Ching, but I think that you should attend my lecture recital sometime. And then yeah. I'll tell you more about it. <laughs> so anyway, that's Per Norgard's Infinity series and consequently the sun and moon music. Well, I'm glad you mentioned how they would improvise using using like a visual aid for the series because he does have that piece that's now notated. It's like an hour long. That's four movements, and I, I, I'm blanking on the title. I know what you're talking about. I don't know the title either. I wish we, I did. It's for it's for something like ten players, 
And yeah, Gert Mortenstein has a, uh, he, he's got a recording of it that he yep. has put together. Yeah, I bet you'll find it real quick. But uh, it supposedly was all, the first time through was all improvisation, but yet they say it has all this number information in it. And a lot of the material is from numbers. So they didn't totally just improvise, but it was a, yeah, number-based improvisation. Right. And so much of his music is structured that way. And it's, um, it's really related to, to Balinese music in the way that it's cyclical and it's hierarchical. And there are just so many layers and levels of the music. And, you know, there are just so many patterns. There's another, a really great article called the patterns of Per Norgard. And it just, the patterns themselves seem infinite or the number of ways that he's organizing things. It's really, he's a, a really brilliant composer. You know, in, in mathematics, I, I know nothing about this other than what my father has told me, because my father is a mathematician, but he he teaches some class where either the whole class is within this branch of math or they just touch on it, but dealing with quantities of infinity, which sounds like such an abstract concept to us because infinity is just infinity, but Megan said the smallest quantity of infinity, like the simplest infinity, which they call Aleph null is the term for that. Okay. So so conceptually, you can imagine numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way continuing on to infinity versus all odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, nine, on to infinity. You can imagine the one with both odds and evens is a bigger quantity of infinity. It's like thicker. So, yeah, this gets like crazy complicated, and that's the end of what I understand of it right there. But it's interesting. Uh, it's neat. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Yeah. It's funny. We keep talking about, like, I guess a week ago, I talked about Ligeti and chaos theory, and it had all these yes. fractal relationships. And now this has definitely these very direct fractal relationships. And yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to see visually. Yeah, it's really interesting because a lot of his, his music is also inspired by the chaos, chaos theories and it's like organized chaos is kind of his thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I just wanted to mention his other solo percussion works in case people are looking for repertoire and want to check it out. Uh, there are five, five pieces, Waves, which is written in 1969, I Ching in 82, Energy Fields Forever, 86, Nemo Dy Dynamo, 89, and Arabesques in 2001. And they're all for pretty large setups, you know, I Ching is, is giant. Uh, and a lot of, none of these are like solo marimba or something. They're all multi-percussion pieces often containing keyboards. So the one I was looking for is called a light hour. Okay. Yeah. This, yep. It's funny, Casey, that you brought up, Casey, you said something along the lines of, it's funny that we keep talking about all this mathematical stuff, but to me, it kind of makes sense because music is music composition. As I understand it, coming from a non-composer's perspective is all about simply just organization and when we think a lot of about a lot of the Debussy's or the Bartok's, these people that kind of threw away everything that came before them, they simply just came up with a new way of organizing pitches or organizing structure in some sort of hierarchical way. And even uh, Zach Browning, who we had on the podcast at this point quite a while ago, all of his music is based on uh, feng shui and... Uh, there's some other term he had and the golden ratio and this other term I'm blanking on. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting that Zach Browning takes this very sort of ancient Chinese architecture, so to speak, and combines it with influences from James Brown and funk music to create like a whole new style of music. But yeah, I think that's what it comes down to is just, it's simply a way for a composer to organize his music. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I sometimes get irritated when people try to get, I don't know, when they get overly mathematical about, I mean, really anything in a way. like it's, Yeah, yeah. It's... You kind of, I, I remember we studied in one of my music history classes, like Schoenberg, and then his two big contemporaries were Berg and Weber, or his uh, protégés, I should say. Yeah. And Weber, and, sorry, with an N. And uh, I think it was Berg would always compose and listen to what he wrote and then would edit it to make it sound like what he wanted. And Webern would just leave it mathematically how it was. And Berg's works are more kind of listenable, I think, because of it. Yeah. I, and I guess I mean, I don't know. It's uh, I don't know. 
when people are when people say oh music and math are so similar it's like wait show me something that isn't mathematical yeah yeah you know what i mean like yeah. it's it's like uh you know like everything is it's just like everything in the natural world is chemistry you know like show yeah. me show me something that isn't chemistry <laughs> like you can't you know show me something that can't be described mathematically somehow yeah but but yeah it's all it's all it's all pretty fascinating yeah thanks megan very cool i would love yeah, to of I, course. we would have loved to come down to richmond and see your lecture oh no worries it's a yeah, drive next, for you guys <laughs> next, next time though next time yeah. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone have a, a last question for Danny and Molly? I'd, I'd love to end with something from them. Well, my questions are a little bit personal, but they're, I guess, maybe one for Molly is just that I think you're working with my friend Bill Whipple. Yeah, he just started here. Yeah, one of my best friends, Christina, is married to Bill. Good. And um, so I was just wondering if you can kind of tell us about your, your experience teaching at University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire so far. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm just starting my fourth year here. Um, I teach viola and music theory and oral skills. Cool. Um, I'm interested. So my position on paper is two-thirds like music theory oral skills, one-third viola. As it plays out in real life, it's like 100% theory oral skills, 100% viola. Yeah. Um, so, so like know. double job. <laughs> and this year, actually, I'm not teaching any written theory. For the last three years, I've been teaching mostly written theory and a little bit of oral skills. This year, it's all oral skills for like a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting to find, you know, I was just telling Danny earlier today, like this semester, really, I only have time to practice on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Like my yeah. Monday, Wednesday, Fridays are so packed and on the weekends yeah. I have to plan class and grade homework, you know, so making sure that I'm like super, super, super efficient when I do have, have time to practice. But yeah, that's the, the biggest thing for me has been balancing out like my course responsibilities with needing to practice. Yeah. yeah. We Tell talk about, about that yeah. a lot on here. I think, you know, it's, it's a constant conversation because it's like, there's always more you can do at school, you know? It's really right. hard. I think it's one of the biggest challenges about having a university job is like when to just say no. I mean, you have you really have to protect your practice time. Oh, it's yeah. hard to oh, do. Totally. Yeah. Uh, question from Laurel, I think. Oh, yeah. It was just back to the, the CD. And I'm curious, did you guys apply for any grants for it? Or did you just fund it yourselves? Or we yeah, we um, we got a grant from my university that we applied for, um, and then we also did a big Kickstarter. Danny, when was that? Was that that was last year, wasn't it? Yeah, so we did we did a big Kickstarter that was also really successful that that funded the rest of it. And I have to say, I went into the whole Kickstarter thing really skeptical. I thought, I don't know, you know, because to have a successful Kickstarter campaign, you really it does require a significant investment of time and energy to really if you're really going to do it right. And I don't like half-assing anything. Um, and I was like, I don't know if this is really going to work. But I was totally proven wrong. And we were just really overwhelmed by the outpouring of support from, you know, the usual kind of like the usual suspects, friends and family. But also like, you know, people we haven't heard from in decades, people who we didn't know. I mean, it was very, uh, very validating that people would want to support such a weird project. <laughs> That's awesome. Our, yeah. Our our friend Bill Schultes just did the same thing. He got funding for his Kickstarter and he got his, yeah, he got his funding for the CD he's recording or mm -hmm. just finished recording. And yeah, it's very cool. It's such a, I don't know, it's such a selfless thing. Sure, it's your CD, you're performing on it, but it helps out all these composers. It helps the repertoire. And I think a lot of people are very easy to get on board with something like that. I did see a Kickstarter once. Hey guys, I want to write a method book and i want y'all to pay me to do it <laughs> yeah i mean that's the thing it has to be a project that's that 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 people really want to have it, it has to be presented in the right, right. way like, it's like, so like, easy to for that to come off the wrong way like nobody nobody was asking this bozo to do this <laughs> well, well also there's yeah. there's not really an and overhead cost no to, there's not really an overhead cost to writing a method book like recording an album Right, like you right. gotta like this money. Right, like there's no, 
there's a certainty that the money you guys raised was going to the cost yeah. of the CD and like compensating the venue or the engineer or the composers or, you know, it wasn't just going straight in your pocket. This dude, I couldn't believe it. He got no, literally no donations. You know, maybe he put one up himself to make it look like people cared, but yeah, yeah. Give me money to write a method book I want to write because I should be compensated for my for my time. Yeah, it wasn't anyone we know, Ben. I don't even I don't even remember. It was just some it was just some dude. Well, I think I think one of the reasons our Kickstarter was successful is because well, first of all, we did take the time to make the actual Kickstarter campaign look pretty decent, and we had all the information there, and it was very clear that. At that point, we had almost finished recording the album already, and it was very clear that you know we had a we were almost had the product, and we had a specific plan for um, for you know following through. And one of the reasons I'm really glad it worked out is because having the CD released on Innova, which is such an awesome label because it's part of the American Composers Forum, so it's a nonprofit. So they're not actually making any money from from the album, but having it on Innova means that it, it's out there, and you know it, it was just released, so. We're still kind of working out some of the kinks uh, with different um, online distributors, but really, it should be out there everywhere. Um, so we really yeah. get maximum exposure for the music. Yeah, because they're distributed through Naxos, which is the largest distributor of classical music in the world. So. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, I saw it on Naxos. I saw it on even YouTube. YouTube has that automated streaming thing. So yeah, I mean, that's 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 a really that's right. a yeah, really it's on, success. But on uh, iTunes, it's on Spotify. It's on Amazon, although the, the metadata for Amazon are like super messed up right now. It says Danny wrote all of the pieces on the CD, or I wrote all the pieces on the CD, or something. Oh, something. nice. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're fixing that. But yeah, it's great. it's great that the music's out there because, like we were talking about earlier, you know, I hope that composers and performers will will hear that and be inspired and, and want to do something similar or uh, or play some of these pieces or, uh, or get involved in our project. Yeah. yeah. Well, feel free to not answer this, but I'm curious because you said you'd already recorded a lot before you started the Kickstarter. If the Kickstarter didn't follow through, what were you going to do? We would have, um, out of our own pockets, we would have just done a, a self-release, you know, which which means the CD would have been out there and it would have been available, but it wouldn't get the same kind of support that we get from the record label. Um, Innova, like I said, you know, they're a nonprofit. They're they're a nonprofit that specifically exists to promote contemporary classical music. So, um, and you know, they have uh, they have a team that takes care of all the distribution uh, in a much more thorough way than we could do if we did a just low budget, self funded, self release. And then they also have a team that handles um, publicity and marketing. So, um, you know, it's not the same as like being on a major record label, obviously, but um, you know, they, uh, they really do uh, their best to uh, generate buzz about the, the album and get it out there. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely uh, much preferable to a, a no budget, self funded, <laughs> self release where you just kind of like say, oh, okay, I got the CD. Yeah. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> yeah. Very, yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Well, guys, it's time to wrap up. So, man, Molly and Danny, thanks so much. And again, congratulations. It's just, it's a great disc. Thanks. Thank thanks you so much. Awesome. Sure. Nice okay, everybody. You guys. We will catch you on one fifteen. So, okay, everyone, take care. Bye. 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 Like all the waving, it's good. I know. <laughs>